So this is really, um, I have two aims in this, and I hope that um, what I can do is inspire you to use these data, which is kind of this project that we got at um, Cornell and had for many years, and it was also uh, part of the, the project here. Um, and it's all about uh, essentially a research design that compares uh, outcomes across countries. So there's lots of reasons to think about doing that, and I hope I'm going to uh, convince you that it's a useful design for whatever it is that you're interested in. So uh, I'm just going to quickly go through this. We've got an hour, right? Mm -hmm. okay. uh, I think I can get through it in an hour. Mm -hmm. um, so well, this is what I'm going right? to um, to cover, and I'm going to try and um, cover some of the just sort of general concepts. I don't think I probably have to spend too much time on motivating why <laughs> one might want to harmonize, because I think uh, everyone here is in the business of harmonizing. Um, but I, I want to talk about, uh, in the context of this particular data set, uh, some of the issues that come up. Because there's some, uh, the way that we run the CNA, the cross-national equivalent file, is um, invites or we, we want researchers to contribute new data to it. So it's sort of this interactive uh, project. Uh, and I'll explain more about that later. I'm going to cover some of the very practical and sometimes technical issues that come up uh, in that process. And then uh, I'll try and do it in the context of this project that I had funded for uh, one year and it's applied to a project on smoking uh, internationally. Okay. So um, I guess I don't need to uh, convince you that it's useful to uh, create data that can be easily compared across countries. There's lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of interest in this issue, both at a sort of casual consumer level and also at a policy level. Uh, it, it's, it's amazing when you do something like this, do a quick search of Google and just say cross-national or sort of comparisons, there are millions of hits and they appear in newspaper articles every spring. There's um, a set of results that come out of the PISA, which is this uh, international um, effort to try and compare educational outcomes across countries. Um, and so every spring there are dozens of articles or so on saying, how does Canada rank the United States? How does it rank relative to Korea and all this kind of stuff? People obviously have a demand for those sorts of comparisons. It's like baseball teams. They want to know if their home team is doing better than the competing team. But there's not much data to back it up. And so PISA is, is uh, an example of an effort where they're actually trying to collect data in a very systematic way. Um, the kind of data that we're taking advantage of are panel data. So it's a household-based survey that is going back every year to the same group of individuals and asking questions to track changes in their economic and social status over time. Uh, over the last 15 years, um, both with funding from uh, the US and other countries, many, many, many countries are now starting to mount these kinds of surveys, both with special populations. So you may be aware of there's a set of uh, surveys out there that sample people who are age 50 and older at the time of their first interview. Those aging studies are underway in many countries around the world. So all of the OECD countries, China, Korea, Thailand, India, has just got a new one that started. And they're all explicitly designed to try and make them as comfortable as possible for obvious reasons from a policy perspective, because of this demographic bulge that developed countries are now experiencing, this is going to be a huge issue. And to the credit of most of the governments around the world, they're trying to develop the social science statistics that need that we need to provide evidence to inform policy decisions. So panel data are lacking. And if you uh, try and look at the set of studies that actually use data as opposed to just talk, there's very few um, studies. So uh, from a scientific perspective and um, from a social science perspective in particular, these kind of data and the ability <coughs> to compare data across uh, countries has lots and lots of advantages. So um, 
one of the things is that this last point is uh, one I think that uh, is underappreciated. That Canada and the United States actually have an advantage that we get variation in policies across different geographic regions. In many countries of the world, you don't get that because policy is kind of small country policies are set at a national level, and the only variation you get is across time. And that makes it difficult uh, to separately identify effects of trends that are changing over time in similar ways as the policies are changing. Um, so if you can compare across countries, you get, uh, first of all, sometimes very different sets of policies that are being implemented in different countries. So you get that kind of uh, identification. And you also get the chance to look at different mixes of policies. So policies are often similar uh, in many countries, but they're put together in different ways. And that uh, provides a research design that allows us to then uh, study interesting questions. And so uh, in the area that I'm working on, for example, in um, consumption of tobacco, um, the amount that tobacco is taxed or the way that it's regulated where people can smoke has changed really dramatically over time. It's only recently that many European countries have uh, passed and started to enforce uh, bans on where people can smoke. And so there's nice variation within the European countries, you know, sort of uh, inside of the EU, but also over time in these countries. And um, of course, in the United States and Canada, we get lots and lots of variation like this as well. Okay, um, so let me start to get into what is special about SENA and um, how we kind of think about harmonization. Uh, one of the difficulties people have when they're harmonizing data, and you'll discover this when you submit journal articles, is people say, oh, you can't compare this. There's too much uh, culture and all these other things that differ between these two countries. So uh, a candidate, any kind of data that's a candidate for harmonization, in our opinion, has to fit uh, these kinds of criteria, has to have a very well-defined theoretical concept. So for example, age. Uh, now you, you laugh, but then you, know, you sort of think about countries where they you know, might have um, a different concept of age, but it, it, it has some link to a very objective measure. So uh, time is the same, you know, physical time is the same in all countries. Uh, so these kinds of things uh, are natural candidates, quite obviously. Uh, but then there are other things like uh, income or prices, marital status, occupations, industry that at least in principle can be constructed to be equivalent across countries. It may be difficult to do it. So if you think about occupation, in the United States for years and years and years, we have a dictionary of occupational titles. And they uh, sat down at the Department of Labor and assigned some research assistant to go through and write down all the occupations that people, that they could find, and then try and define what those occupations consisted of in terms of education you needed, what your tasks were, whether you interacted with people or didn't, and all this kind of stuff. Well, that's the kind of thing you would have to do to um, equate occupations across countries. Now, the job is made easier because there are international standards that have tried to do this. And so the only difficulty really in our effort is that um, some countries like the United States doesn't use, or the surveys, doesn't use the international standard of occupational classification. They use their own census-created standard. And so then there's still work to sit down and say, well, is a bookkeeper in the United States equal to this in the ISOC? OK, so here's some of the practical considerations. Now, I said that there are now 30 or more countries around the world that have household-based panel uh, studies. There's plenty of potential to uh, obviously, you have to have the raw data uh, to uh, do this uh, exercise. Um, the measure that you create has to be consistent both within uh, the survey, that is within the country, and across countries. Now, people often uh, ignore that because they think of 
uh, a survey that's conducted inside the country and say, oh, well, that's the same. But if you look at any long running survey, the questions change, the wording changes, the categories that people are allowed to respond change. And so really what is required is that you harmonize first within the country and then you can harmonize across the country. So one of the data sets that we have in the cross-national protocol, for example, is a kind of study of income dynamics that's been running for 39 years in the United States. And as you might imagine, because uh, interest change and uh, the PI changes, uh, the um, board of overseers of the survey changes, the questions themselves have changed a lot. And one of the values of this project uh, in particular, but harmonization projects in general, is that it, it provides the internal consistency as well. So uh, the RAND Corporation in the United States, for example, has harmonized sections of the health and retirement study much in the same way that CNF does, and HRS supports it. So they will send people to the, the RAN HRS website where all the variables that have been harmonized have the same name across years and have been designed, designed to be comparable, and they provide the background uh, information that a researcher needs to go back to the original data and say, do I agree with the decisions that they made? Well, actually, to back up what you're saying, some of my students have used the CNF data in using the survey of labor income dynamics rather than using the, the raw data from the survey of labor income dynamics. A lot of people. So we have people who do that. And I'll, I'll talk about uh, when we get to the, the interest that you might have is, do I want to use these data? I'll talk about different ways of thinking about how to use the data. Uh, because I think there's lots of ways that you can profitably take advantage of the work that's been done in the CNF resolving data. Okay, so here's, uh, this by the way now includes Korea. I, I mentioned it on the slide there, but I haven't um, uh, mentioned it here uh, in, in this bold graphic. So this is the, the way that um, we currently operate. Uh, the project started because uh, Rich Berghauser teamed up with a German researcher to do a comparison of income of women who experienced a divorce in Germany and the United States. And they were saying, okay, we want to compare this. We're going to look at, and, and back then it was just the SOAP and the PSID. And so as part of that project, they got the National Institute on Aging to give them $5 million. And uh, they published, their paper that came out of it was had 44 cases. And it got published in demography, lead article in demography. So you can't do that anymore. <laughs> Sorry. But anyway, from that, what they said as part of their application was, we need to spend a lot of time uh, trying to make these data comparable between these two countries because we really want to understand how the economic well-being of uh, people in these two countries changes after this marital disruption. And as a result of that, we've created all these data like age and marital status and income and things like that. We're just going to make it available for the research community. So no, there's no reason that other people have to redo the work that we already did. And that was the start. And then after that, uh, it sort of expanded uh, to include all these countries. And the original uh, data that they uh, harmonized was something smaller than this. And over the years, uh, as we've funded different new research projects, it's expanded a little bit. So originally, the rule was it had to be present in both PSID and SOAP. Well, we added um, the British Household Panel Study and the Survey of Labor and Income Dynamics in 1998, I think. Uh, and at that point, we sort of had to go to a different rule, which is it has to be present in at least two of the surveys. So we can't get it present necessarily in all of them, although I'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, so all the stuff that's in red is out there and is available to anybody who wants to do research, right? A comparative study. And this is why I think this is a really rich resource for research. For anybody who has an idea, uh, you can, take all this stuff and say all the hard work has been done on that, 
all I really have to do is add a few new variables that exist in these two countries. There's still a lot of hard work involved, but it's not as much as if we were trying to do it from scratch. Okay, so the uh, easy stuff we did, sorry, uh, which is just uh, make things uh, on a common metric. So age in months, we converted to age in years, how you feed, we have in meters, you know, weight in pounds is now in kilos, all that stuff we did. Maybe there'll be new stuff like that, but <coughs> easy, you can get the quick, cheap publication. Uh, but the next thing that is a little bit more difficult is how do you reconcile response categories to cover the same um, responses? And that's not as easy. It always is, involves uh, going to a lowest common denominator. Uh, and so then when you're trying to decide whether it makes sense to make something comparable, you have to ask yourself, do I lose so much information by going to the lowest common denominator that I'm not, I don't expect to learn much uh, if this is my main outcome of interest. And then uh, some of the really difficult stuff is um, coming and saying, do I have something that has a clear conceptual basis, clear theoretical uh, uh, construct? Uh, if you do, you can come to, to the data, to two or more of the data sets and say, is there enough information collected here that allows me to pull together something that I think is comparable. So in the CNF, a lot of the really hard work was spent on uh, measure of household income. And in any uh, country-based survey, the way surveys are designed, they're often designed to achieve some national policy interest. Uh, so there's a focus that's country specific that may or may not line up with what's going on in other countries. So income's a perfect example. And you can think about just in Canada, all the different kinds of sources of income, public and private, that you could uh, get money from that might be included on a survey. And so Phil Giles at Statistics Canada spent a lot of time sort of going through all these different programs. And then that is unlikely to line up with the set of pro programs that we have in the United States or in Britain or in Germany. And so what we did is, um, so here's an example of the response categories. So if you think about, this is one of the questions that is asked, uh, how many people work with you or do you work? And you think, well, how do I reconcile this? And you can see that, well, down here, that's easy. Uh, here, I don't know what you would do, right? You know, how can you sort of construct that? Uh, and so, you have to confront those sort of questions. This uh, gives you just a little bit of the flavor of um, the kinds of things that we evaluated should go into the measure of individual labor earnings. And so, for example, if you've never uh, encountered uh, European wage system, they get a 13th month of pay and a 14th month. So the workers feel much better, right? Because instead of having their annual income divided by 12, it's divided by 14, and they get it, and they get a Christmas bonus pay, and then they get a holiday bonus pay. And so uh, there were lots of what's, what's that? They also have miscellaneous bonus pay. Miscellaneous <laughs> bonus pay. There's all kinds of stuff, right? And uh, so in the construction of the income for, from labor earnings. There was a long debate about whether that's, you know, is bonus pay labor earnings or is that like uh, some sort of windfall gain? And the decision was to put it in labor earnings because almost every worker gets it. So, you know, a huge fraction of workers get it. And you can only get it if you're employed, right? So it's not as though you suddenly, you know, get this receipt. Like in Alaska, everyone gets a check, which is their share of the oil revenues that year. And, all you have to be as a resident of Alaska. Well, that's not labor earnings. You have, don't have to work to get it. You just sort of have to be a resident of the state. Anyway, this is the kind of thing that uh, went into the construction of the uh, labor earnings. And it, uh, it's not just there. So for example, uh, marital status is another one of those categories where you have to think uh, carefully about uh, 
what it is that I want to measure, and then um, we have to go to a lowest common denominator. So for example, in uh, the British Household Panel Study, they have uh, a lone parent unmarried and a lone parent mar you know, formerly married, and they distinguish between those two categories, but the PSIE doesn't. So we had to go to a lowest common denominator. Now, until we added the Australian sample, um, people who were interested specifically in that kind of marital status <coughs> as an outcome of interest had nothing to compare it to. But Australia does collect uh, the same information. We haven't yet uh, created a variable to expand the definition of marital status. So if somebody was interested, they're interested in poverty or in you know, the, um, the well-being of children under different marital statuses, you could uh, look at that. So I said, the last point that I had on the slide before was that uh, we create new data. And the um, one of the principal pieces of value that we add in the CNAP data is that uh, we grapple with this issue of before tax and after tax income. And in cross-national comparisons, that's maybe the biggest, uh, one of the biggest uh, issues that people have difficulty confronting. Because the tax structure, the way taxes are assessed, differs really, really widely across countries. Sometimes people don't even know whether they're getting before tax or after tax income in some countries because it's taken out uh, before they ever see it. And so they just get uh, a check, and that's they think of that as their income. And so uh, in the original uh, construction of the data, which took the German SOAP and the PSID, we took advantage of a program that was written by Daniel Feinberg at the National Bureau of Economic Research that for the United States does a tax simulation. And he's also, I mean, this is also one of those public goods. Anybody can use these data. It's like doing your taxes, not quite as detailed as doing your taxes, but you fill out all the information and then it will spit out the computed tax for both at the federal and the state level. And so we use that. We take the PSID data and we treat everybody. We basically do 30,000 tax returns every year, right? We just sort of use tax them. For Germany, uh, Rich used part of that money from the National Institute on Aging to hire somebody to write that program for Germany. And we paid uh, Stephen Jenkins at the British Household Panel Study to do the same thing for the United Kingdom. So we have tax simulation programs for those countries. In Canada, uh, Statistics Canada in the context of SLID had done this very clever thing which was ask respondents if they would allow them to connect to their tax records so we can get the after tax. But anyway, this is, you can see that in the Swiss household panel, when the Swiss came to us and said, may we join CNA? We said, yeah, but we need to do this. They said, well, we don't have it done yet. And um, we said, okay, we still think there's value in having the Swiss data there. And so the plans are in the works to do this. Um, any of you are public finance types who love tax code, uh, it's at the Canton level in Switzerland. So, <laughs> um, so anyway, um, the cross-national fund file from the, the data provider perspective is attractive because there aren't many social scientists who are interested in social science questions isolated in Switzerland, right? So there's a very small community. But if they join CNA, which they've done, um, once you've written a program to compare these outcomes for one country, then you sort of say, well, it would be interesting to add Switzerland because it's available, the data are comparable, it's relatively low cost, and so um, they get a wider data, uh, set of, of researchers that are using the data. Um, and we get to learn something because there are differences across countries. So now, um, I'll explain more about how we're in. Okay, so we now have seven uh, panel studies that are in, and these are uh, available in all the countries. And, sorry. Uh, so I mentioned before that one of the ways in which you can think about how you can use these data to enhance your research 
is you can say, well, I want to do a cross-country comparison. If I want to use any of these or some of these as control variables, you don't have to do any of the work. It's already been done, right? And so that means that your research project is going to potentially tack on a couple of variables that are included in, in the CDEP, but this is the stuff that's already there. And so lots of researchers, lots of the people who use our data uh, use it in exactly that way. They sort of say, I want to look at comparison of Germany and Britain, and I'm just going to use these equivalized measures of income or uh, education, or well, actually education you don't have in the British household panel, but I'm going to use whatever's here that uh, I can use as controls. And then on top of that, they say, and I want to look specifically at childhood poverty in Britain, Germany. And so then they do all the work to uh, pull those data off of the country, the original country uh, panels, and then they try to make them as equivalent as possible. So it saves you time if you're doing that. Um, one of the things that uh, we uh, sort of took up uh, several years ago, um, Rich was asked to serve on the, um, the board of overseers for the panel study of income dynamics. And so we, we tried to push them really hard to expand the set of health variables that they included on uh, the PSID successfully. Starting in 99, uh, they added uh, the SF12 and expanded the set of health questions that are there. And this is kind of an ongoing effort uh, on our part, also motivated by this idea that, you know, the demographic bulge is uh, forcing us to confront a lot of different questions that are really important in the policy world and for public policy. There's a huge international component and Health in particular is one of those areas that is very conducive to cross-national comparisons because so much of it is rooted in a biological basis. Right? I remember I said that cross-national comparisons really have a lot of power when uh, there's a process that is shared because we're humans. Right? So pregnancy, disease prevalence, uh, um, frailty, activities of daily living, those are things that are tied to us as human beings that should be commonly shared across countries, but there's also some scope for differences in behavior because of incentives or policies or living conditions. And so it's the ideal area for cross-national comparisons. Um, this last thing uh, is uh, set is a question that uh, is present on the SWP and in the Hilda, and also, I didn't list it, but it's also on the BHPS. Um, that is a new, um, very popular area of research, all this happiness research or satisfaction research or things like that, and how it relates um, to health and to perceptions of health. And there's a whole body of research that looks cross-nationally. I don't know if you're familiar with this research, but um, Rand has a group of people, there's a group of people at Tilburg University that are um, looking at responses to these self-rated health measures across countries. And they're saying, you know, people uh, anchor their assessment of health relative to people in their country. So if you look objectively, uh, Danes and the French are healthier than the Spaniards. But if you look at self-reported health, uh, the Spaniards rate themselves in much um, much better health than the Danes and the French. And you say, well, that's, that's odd. And so some of the ways that uh, researchers are very creatively um, trying to get at that is this thing called vignettes. Have you discovered these vignettes? And so what it is is they present a scenario of a hypothetical person and say, how would you rate this person's health? And they present some objective, like they're missing an arm or they're you know, bound to a wheelchair and how would you rate their health? And they use that as the relative measure to anchor people's perceptions of health. And because everybody in each country is presented with the same vignette, then they can use that and say, okay, once we adjust the fact that the Danes only see clouds and depressed all the time, you know, <laughs> then, you know, we can sort of see that in fact they are healthy. 
So it's, uh, there's very interesting research that's going on. We're pushing in uh, across national employment cloud to try and add these questions to other countries, other country surveys. Uh, so there'll be uh, scope in the future to do that kind of research um, in um, using CNA. A lot of people around the world are using the SOEP. I'll mention some of them today because they've got a uh, very innovative, um, rich set of questions on satisfaction and workload work and health and job and all kinds of things. Okay, so let me get back to the philosophical approach. Um, in contrast, uh, so I was talking about uh, the European Community Household Panel yesterday at dinner, and um, a few years ago, um, the National Institute on Aging asked us to evaluate um, this new survey called the Survey of Health, Aging, and Retirement in Europe, which um, was funded partly by the U.S. Uh, by the European Union, and so uh, they commissioned. Uh, Rich Berkhauser and me to evaluate it to see how successful they were uh, in creating data that were comparable by the way the survey itself was designed. So the original share was implemented in uh, 12 countries in Europe with a common survey design where they tried to um, make the data comparable. The share is the second of such efforts. The first one was in the European Community Household Panel. And so we used that as our straw man. That meant we sort of set it up and said, here's a failure. And uh, share is by and large a success. One of the reasons that we think that the European Community Household Panel was a failure is because it was conceived and implemented uh, from European Statistical Office. So statisticians were the people who were saying, oh, we need to make this comparable. They weren't informed by a theory or a concept that flowed from a, a foundation in a particular discipline. And as a result, the measures that were created in the European Household Panel are often idiotic. I mean, nobody in any discipline would look at it and say, I can't use that. It doesn't match what my field uses as its basis. And so as a result, uh, it, you know, the data were perfectly comparable across countries, but nobody <laughs> would ever use them, right? Yeah. That's an example. Um, so, <laughs> in, so income, for example, uh, economists have spent a lot of time thinking about like, all those things we talked about with income. Well, they only took earnings, right? <laughs> and you sort of, so that was the only question or something like that. And you say, well, but I know people are getting all these other uh, sources of income in these other countries, and yet they're not measured. So how can I compare across countries when I am missing systematically all these data? So in SENA, uh, because of the way that it started, it was driven by uh, researchers who were trying to answer a substantive research question. And they were doing it from a disciplinary perspective. So they brought with them some concept. And for better or worse, you know, it's not as though economists have the answer to the way things should be conceptualized. But at least it was uh, capturing something that got used by a particular discipline. Uh, more importantly, I think, uh, the data weren't made comparable just for the sake of making data comparable. They were made comparable to answer a particular question. And that meant that there was a lot of work and a lot of thought, a lot of effort for, put into thinking about institutional details specific to each country that fed back into either the concept or how people thought about the concept or how to measure it. And so, that was the first, that's one of the, still one of our guiding principles. And the other thing that we do is we try and say, we don't necessarily have the answer. Uh, maybe a sociologist or epidemiologist would object to the way that we counted, say, income from public sources. Uh, and so, full disclosure, we're going to publish and we publish the algorithm with the variable names from the original data set and how they're manipulated to get to where we got. 
Uh, the data are available. Sometimes you have to fill out data use agreements with the country in question. Uh, and we provide the SAS code. Uh, eventually, we'll also provide SATA code. So that means that a researcher who objects and say, no, no, I want to do something different. Or even better, they say, I think you made a mistake. And this isn't right, because you said you used this variable, but it doesn't match up with what are in the data. That happens. Uh, not often, because researchers tend to be lazy, and you think, oh, well, I don't have to do all that work. But for the perfectionists, they kind of come back and say, no, that doesn't make sense. And so they check. There's an open debate. And we ask. Uh, if somebody, one of you, I'm now trying to plant little seeds in your head and say, well, I need to create data for SIGMA, and so it's going to keep you awake at night. When you publish your paper, you provide us with the algorithm, and your paper has passed peer review, and we added the CNF. Right? And so we added the CNF, and we say, if you use these data, you should cite this paper. So you get the at least the end of this uh, get citations. So here's kinds of research that people are using uh, CNA for. Stephen Jenkins, a bunch of co-authors, have done a lot with comparing child poverty in Germany and the United Kingdom. Income inequality is a big source, Berghauser and Joachim Frick and uh, Joachim Nevs. And a lot of people are doing comparisons of income inequality. I've done a little bit of work on intergenerational earnings mobility comparing the US and Germany. Um, Rich and I have done some work looking at the relationship between income inequality and self-reported health. Uh, there's a, a, a growing number of researchers who are looking at distributions of wealth, partly because in 84, 89, every five years, the PSID does a special module that asks detailed questions about wealth and asset holdings and stock uh, dividends and all kinds of things. The Germans have recently done an oversample of the highest income people in Germany, and they have a special file <coughs> that tracks wealth. And so there's a lot of uh, potential for comparison. I mentioned marital events. I mentioned income after the death of a spouse. Uh, and so now I'm going to talk a little bit, um, introduce the direction that uh, I've been taking SEMA in the context of a particular project. So we're going to add this year, we we're now in the process of creating a file from Russia for the Russian Longitudinal Monitoring Survey. Um, and uh, we're in discussion with the PIs of panel studies that are ongoing in South Africa. Israel is mounting a new panel study that's going to go into the field in October uh, 2001 probably full implementation in the field in 2012, and data will be available in 2013. Um, Indonesian Family Life Survey, the China Health and Nutrition Study, and the Mexican uh, Family Life uh, Study are all we're kind of uh, in negotiations about creating files for them. Uh, all in the context of a project that uh, I've got going on. Um, so I said, uh, Individual researchers contribute data, so new variables to the CNF, and uh, we're adding countries um, in the context of a particular research project. And so this is the example that I wanted to talk about. I've got a, a grant from the National Cancer Institute and the National Institute of Aging to study um, smoking behavior over the life course in 10 different countries. Um, so the questions that or the substantive part of the research application were um, trying to understand how much policy can affect people's decisions to smoke. It has obvious public health consequences. It has obvious implications for policies because every country, in uh, to some extent, um, subsidizes or pays for the health care of people, and especially because smokers tend to be low income and low educated. Uh, a greater fraction of smokers, when they get cancer, emphysema, or uh, uh, some sort of disease induced by smoking, are much more likely to be, uh, have their care paid for out of public coffers. So there's all kinds of uh, motivations for trying to understand this and take advantage of the policy variation across countries. Um, the data that uh, we need, the data that we have, 
have in each of our surveys is information on when people began to smoke and if they no longer smoke when they quit. Um, it's all retrospectively reported data. So at the time of the survey, it doesn't matter whether you're a current smoker or not because you're answering information. I'm gonna talk about this later today as well uh, in one of the papers that's coming out of this project. So uh, we're using CNF data for, for these countries. Uh, and I mentioned before, so when I showed that um, um, table with the health data that are available in the different countries, you, there were some white uh, cells where the data weren't available. And when I started this project, uh, the British data and the German data were missing pieces of the information that I needed. So for example, the British data asked in 1999 uh, for people who ever smoked at what age did you start, but they didn't ask an exact question about the age that they had quit. They sort of had these broad categories like six months to a year ago, one to five years, six to 10, and then more than 10. And so for anybody who quit more than 10 years ago, I had no idea when they quit. Uh, but I need the exact data, partly because I work closely with the PIs of all of these data sets, but also because uh, they were amenable to it. They added questions to their survey for me. And so they helped me fill in those white cells that were missing the data. Germany did, this, did the same thing. In Australia, I entered into a long negotiation with the Australian government and the people running this survey they added the whole section on smoking uh, to their uh, survey in 2007. So I was really lucky uh, that they were uh, amenable to this because it made this project possible. So all of them asked this question. Uh, they differ in some ways, uh, PSID, BHPS, on the cessation. They all asked the same thing on the start. How old were you when you started? Uh, for quitting, PSID and BHPS both ask at what age or how old were you when you last smoked regularly? And in SOAP and Hilda, they say, uh, in what calendar year did you quit? And so this is now uh, moving from the hypothetical, like, oh, wouldn't it be great if we sort of made these data comparable across countries to the specific? And so now I'm going to start to peel this onion. That's the way you should think about making data comparable. So you've got this onion. And it looks like an onion, and it looks like that onion, right? So you got an onion from Germany and an onion from Australia and from the United States. You say, oh, they're all onions. But then you start to peel them a little bit, and you say, oh, they're not. This one's got a different color on the next level down. And, oh, God. You know, it's, they're all different. Um, I don't want to discourage you, but I also want to give you full information. Um, so these differences are there. It seems simple. I said, all I need to do is I just need to take the calendar year that somebody <laughs> quit and their age or their birth date and just convert yeah. and we're done, right? So that's, you peel the end and you say, oh, wow, the second level looks exactly the same too. So I'm fine, right? But here's what happens when you look at the response categories, right? And anybody who's ever worked with any data I don't care what it is, people are lazy when they answer <laughs> questions, right? It takes mental effort. And so what they do is they round up, round up income to units of $500 or $1,000. Say, how much do you earn in a year? And you see this distribution, say, oh, look, there are a lot more people who earn $10,000 than people who earn 9999 Is that an accident? No. <laughs> it's much easier. You know, maybe their paycheck says 10000 but I doubt it. So this is what you see if you look at the age distribution for people who said, what age did you last smoke regularly? And it looks like it's almost the same in Britain and the United States. Uh, when you take the data from the SOAP that says, in what calendar year did you last smoke regularly? And you say, well, I'm just gonna convert this into age. You say, wow, that looks pretty good. And that's a little bit bumpy. You know, there's a little bit of sort of variation. That's measurement error. And, uh, but it looks like what I would expect, you know, that people maybe they're more likely to quit at 40 because it's some sort of watershed event. Uh, but you wouldn't question it, right? However, if you go back to the original data, 
and you say, ah. Oh. This is, so the question was asked in 2002, and it says, how many years has it been since you quit smoking? And you say, well, 20 compared to 19 or 21? That doesn't seem right. Why would somebody quit exactly 20 years ago? Which means that at the time they answered the survey, or the time that they quit, they didn't know that in 20 years they were going to be answering the survey, right? So there's no way they could have known that I need to do this now because I want to say I quit 20 years ago exactly, right? So that can't be a behavioral, a true behavioral difference between 19 and 21 and 20. Now you look at these other ones and say that's 22 and that's 17. Well, why is that? It was asked in 2002. So then you start to say, oh, look at that, 1980. 1985, 1990. Now it's true that in 1990, East and West German unified, and maybe <laughs> that was the event everyone was waiting for to say, this is the year I quit. But I don't think so. And so if I go back and I say, oh, you know, I'm just going to do this nice quick conversion, first of all, it doesn't look the same. Right? That and that, those two distributions are not the same. And I want to know how policy affected people's decisions to quit. That's one of the outcomes. So this is measurement error. It's a particular type of measurement error. It's a particular serious type of measurement error. I don't want to do this because what I do is I build in to my analysis measurement error that's hidden. I can't even identify it if I run this model on age, age plus smoking. So it means that if you're a careful researcher, and this is another reason that having a substantive research project guide the harmonization matters, because a statistician would just say, oh, we're just gonna do this conversion, put it on a common metric, and then flunk. And they never look at the data. I had a research assistant at one point, a graduate student, wasn't a very good graduate student, and we were doing a comparison of women's earnings. And so I said, okay, take these data from 1966, young women, 14 to 24, and bring me back their average hourly earning. So she brought it back. And I said, did you look at these data? You know, did you think about it? She goes, why? I said, here's a woman in the data that says she's earning $600 an hour, and she's 24 years old. I said, don't you think that's a little bit odd? Right? So <laughs> you would think that you would look at the distribution, think about it a little bit, but if you don't have anything in your head that allows you to understand what you should be gauging that relative to, which a lot of times statisticians don't, they look at a distribution and say, yeah, that looks like a nice inverse Gaussian distribution. It's got well-behaved moments, so there's no reason to question it. Um, this is why substantive researchers in the context of answering substantive research questions, will produce data for CNAP that we think are uh, superior to just uh, harmonization. Okay, so I said that you know it's going to weaken inferences. There are all these scientific reasons that you don't want to treat the data in a naive fashion. Um, so what we're doing in the context of this project is we're developing uh, methods statistical methods to correct for this type of error. We're doing Monte Carlo uh, fit of the data and smoothing, and then um, we're developing an algorithm where we can use data from the surveys, both in the cross-sectional and, and in the panel nature, to actually recover the parameters of the original distribution, which will allow us to construct a correction factor. So it has very broad implications, not just for smoking, but for all distributions where this type of measurement error is present. Okay, so, um, how am I doing on time for this? I don't know. Um, 10 minutes. Okay, 10 minutes. Okay, uh, so I'll, I'm not going to go into the details of this. Uh, we're, I just got an email this morning that my co-author has finished the uh, fitting of the data, and it looks fantastic. We were, so we did Monte Carlo simulation where we knew the exact bias. We knew the parameters of the original distribution in our method. So, so they look for this in, in uh, Jazz and economic.
anyway, so this is the kind of thing that we're going to do. We're going to fit and take these people and allocate them for not really. We can't uh, assign them a quit age, but what we can do is we can say, if somebody reports this, there's error of this proportion for those things, and we'll create weights to go back and reweight the data so that, because uh, what you find is if you look at price for these people, price doesn't affect their decision to quit. And it's not surprising because these people really quit here or here, and the price that was enforced here was really affecting the behavior, not the price that was enforced here. Dean, just a, a quick thing about the you know, plausibility of data. You, you have people from five to 10 years old. Really? <laughs> so in her Russian data. Uh, really? yeah. yeah. Haven't you seen this viral, this video? There's this viral video that's yeah. going on. on. Have you guys seen it? There's a two-year-old baby in Indonesia, and they have them, the dad's giving the baby cigarettes. He's smoking like a pack a day. You haven't seen this? What's it? Was it a really fat baby? Yeah, it's oh, really, yeah. really fat baby. <laughs> you can Google it. You can go on YouTube and Google yeah, it. And so you, 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 I mean, they're showing this kid. Yeah, that's you know, the like, same way with that monkey that was I mean, for sure, yeah, baby will suck. I mean, yeah. that's just, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I mean, we usually uh, uh, will exclude people who start before the age of 10, but in the data, they're there. So, and, and they don't keep. <laughs> they're very <laughs> unlikely to keep. You know, sort of, uh, so anyway, this is uh, what we did with the uh, Monte Carlo simulation, where we can go back and replicate the original data with our heaping rule that one I showed before. And this is just to sort of demonstrate that uh, we can simulate the data. And then because we can simulate the data, we know the true underlying distribution. And then we can sort of show how our algorithm recovers the true underlying distribution in the presence of these kinds of rules that people apparently use to report things like this. OK, so in the end, uh, after we've published this paper with this algorithm, we can make this available along with the smoking information in all of these different surveys to all the researchers who want to use SEMA. And we'll have the algorithm, the code that implements the algorithm, the correction, the raw data, the corrected data, uh, or the correction factor, and everybody who wants to use SEMA can use it. So, you know, some people like now I'm focusing on smoking as the outcome. A lot of people want to use smoking as a control variable and say, I want to just, you know, use an indicator for whether or not people are smoking because I want to look at educational attainment or, you know, some people, this one guy uh, I know has looked at whether uh, quitting behavior depends on your wife or your husband's smoking status, right? So. If, it's obviously harder to quit if you're quitting, but your spouse is still smoking and you're in the room, you know, it's, it's difficult. So there it's a right-hand side variable that uh, people can use. Um, it's gonna go into the code book. So there'll be a citation of the paper and we'll make the algorithm and the data available. Um, so I think, and I don't know how to spend too much effort to convince you that there's a lot of, um, both private benefit to you as individual researchers, but also there's a public good that you can help be a part of and contribute to through your effort to harmonize. And I hope that the way that we've set up SENA allows people to get the private returns because it's a lot of work uh, to do this. Um, so that's why we say after your paper has been published, after you've gotten the payback from doing the work to harmonize the data, then we make the data available. And in that way, you don't sort of say, oh, I did all this work, and just as you're finishing something, it says, oh, can I have those data? I say, great, and then they just send it off before you can manage to submit your paper and they get all the credit for it. Um, so I think that uh, in general, researchers uh, should and um, want to contribute to the public good. They've done all this work. CNF provides a platform for you to do that in the sense that you spend a lot of time, a lot of care, a lot of attention developing these measures. You show that they matter in some research paper that has a substantive policy or scientific purpose. 
And then once it's published, once you get the credit for it, you get more credit by putting it in CNET because people are using it and they're citing the paper. And so I'm hoping that we can continue to do this. We've got a lot of efforts underway uh, that at some point I can talk to you individually or, or later um, to try and make this a uh, more formal process for researchers who are working in this area to collaborate. And one way in which you can do that if you're not aware of it, is that each of these countries, so uh, Britain, Germany, Australia, Switzerland, run conferences every other year for people who use the data. So they, they like next year, it will be in Britain, the British Household Panel Study Users Group, and they are now morphing, by the way, I don't know if you know this, into a new survey. So the British Household Panel has and, and, it, and there's a new survey called Understanding Society, which is now the largest household panel study in the world, 100,000 individuals, 40,000 households. Uh, and so it's an amazing <laughs> effort. Right? Don't envy them at all. They <laughs> do all this work. Anyway, next year is going to be in, in July. We'll be their first uh, conference for that new um, panel. They have always supported CNF and they recognize that CNF is an uh, important part of it. But every other year, Germans do it in the off years, the Brits do it, the Australians do it, Swiss do it. And you can go to those meetings. It's a great venue for graduate students to present work, but you also connect with a set of people who are doing uh, cross-national comparative work. And it's, it's a relatively small but growing community of people that are organized with these associated with these particular panel studies. There's a much larger set of international researchers with the aging studies and with lots of other efforts that are continuing. So if you want to see what we've got so far, we're a shoestring operation, but if you Google CNEF for now, you can see what the code books look like. They're really just tabulations of frequencies and means, but the algorithms are there. I guess everyone knows where they have the, they have they the have website them. on the edge Yes. So I, I just had a question because I've actually worked with the team and I found it great. Thank you for doing this Thank you. work. Um, and I'm specifically using PSID, which is you know very difficult. So one of the things I had a big problem with, of course, is merging the CNES data to PSID and back and forth, um, just because PSID is family structure. No, so what you need to do is then, you, I disaggregated eventually the, the PSID into individuals. So uh, the easy way to do it, their yeah. interface is really clunky and it's not very user friendly. So what you should do when you go into their interface is when you select variables, select sex first. Okay. Because when you do that, it automatically kicks you into an individual level observation and any household variable that you choose after that will be mapped back to every individual that's in that household. If you select a household based variable first, <laughs> it doesn't do it, right? So it, it will only... Have to save me months. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's, that's okay. one of those tricks of the PSID. If you ever download data from the data center at uh, Michigan, always select sex first, and then everything else flows through. And then all you need is you need that person ID variable that we haven't seen yet, which tells you exactly how to do it. If you look at X111 LLs, I knew that was terrible. Uh, there's an ID variable in CNF, and if you go to the code book, it tells you what two variables to multiply together, multiply and add together. That's all you need. And it will be generated automatically when you select sex in the data center. Those two variables will appear in, in your um, output file. Okay. I had a kind of related question with that. Is that it's considered now two years? And I'm just wondering what CNF is doing for this. So the T minus two income data, are you just putting that in? Are you we're not even we're not even putting it out. Okay. Yeah. I mean the problem is that uh, so the problem is always uh, researchers who don't take care. So the it would take a lot of work for us to make something that was uh, comparable because the T minus two information is a subset of the data that we use for the annual income measures. 
So we would either have to put a big red flag on the T minus two years and say, warning, 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 Mr. Smith, do not use these data unless you are aware that they are not comparable directly to this, or we would have to go back to all the years in the strain valley. I would like you to do that. If you will do it, you can contribute to the <laughs> we'll, we'll put, what's your name? We'll put the Nicole household income measure. I will name it for you. I-11101, it will be Nicole's household income measure. No? I don't know How else did you want to spend your career? Come on, I don't have to five years. while he's still here, but uh, we'll actually be, I hope many of you will be joining us in the next uh, hour for the, or I guess the next hour and a half for the, the next presentation, but thank you for yeah. the presentation. Thank you.